Greetings, nerdlings. In this video lecture, we're going to be discussing the central nervous system. So, now that I have your attention, this lovely young man's name was Phineas Gage, and he actually survived this. He basically had a railroad stake pushed through his head, and somehow he managed to survive. They actually removed it, and he lived for a while afterwards. So let's go ahead and get started. So the central nervous system is composed of our brain as well as the spinal cord. So what accounts for the difference between white and gray matter? And you may have heard people talk about this, or you may have heard it on TV. So gray matter right here does not have myelinated axons, meaning it's not going to transmit that information very quickly because the axons are unmyelinated, meaning they do not have that myelin sheath. Whereas the white matter right here does contain a myelin sheath. So cerebral spinal fluid. The central canal of the spinal cord and the ventricles of the brain are hollow and they are both filled with cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is filtered from the blood and it functions to cushion the brain and the spinal cord as well as to provide nutrients and remove wastes. This is what they do when they give you a spinal tap. They're actually taking some of that cerebral spinal fluid out and they do this a lot of times when they're testing you to see if you have cancer cells as well as different types of meningitis. Glia. So glia have numerous functions, including to nourish, support, and to regulate the neurons. Embryonic radioglia form tracks along which newly formed neurons migrate. Astrocytes induce cells lining capillaries into the central nervous system to form tight junctions, resulting in a blood-brain barrier, and it restricts the entry of most substances into the brain. So it helps to protect the brain from anything getting in there. Now every once in a while, we do get some type of infection that can go into our brain, such as neurosyphilis. So looking at this diagram, I want to show you a little bit how the peripheral system, or the peripheral nervous system, interacts with the central nervous system. So starting here, we have either an internal or an external stimuli. External stimuli might be me touching something hot, and I'm going to react. An internal stimuli might be something like our body temperature increases or our body temperature decreases and we have an output of shivering or sweating. So then sensory receptors pick this up, the afferent neurons get activated or the interneurons and they go into the central nervous system. The central nervous system then sends a signal coming out which gets sent to an efferent neuron, meaning an actor or an action neuron. These are the ones that are either attached to muscles or glands. So we have two different types of afferent neurons. We have autonomic neurons and motor system neurons. The motor system neurons control the skeletal muscle. The autonomic nervous system goes into one of three categories. The sympathetic division, the parasympathetic division, or the enteric division. These control smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and different glands. So again, we've seen this diagram before. This is an example of a sensory input and a motor output. So we see something or we use one of our five senses. We might see something, we might taste something, we might <laughs> smell something, and we have a sensory output. The sensory input goes into the brain and then we have a motor output, meaning something happens. We might blink our eye, we might eat something, we might move. The vertebrate brain is regionally specialized, so specific brain structures are particularly specialized for diverse functions. These structures arrive during embryonic development. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a short clip about embryonic brain development. So we're introducing ourselves into this process about one month after fertilization when the entire embryo is smaller than the size of a dime. And we're going to look in at the nervous system where relatively small numbers of cells have been allocated and then monitor over the nine months of human gestation the increase in the number of cells and the change in the shape of the central nervous system. So by three months, we have something like a million cells. The nervous system is beginning to exceed the size of the dime. 
you can see that the future forebrain and the cortical region are expanding disproportionately to the rest of the nervous system. By six months, we have hundreds of millions of neurons, and the brain is beginning to take now a familiar shape. You can see the beginnings of the indentations, the sulci and gyri that Eric described, so that by the time we approach the eight and nine months, this is now a familiar picture, and we have tens of billions of nerve cells present. After birth, there's yet further addition of cells to produce the 100 billion or so nerve cells that occupy the human brain. And one remarkable feature is that even in adult life, new neurons are being added. And there is evidence that the rate of new neuronal production depends on the degree of richness of your environment. So every time you come to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute headquarters here, you're going to be producing neurons at a remarkable rate and you will leave with more neurons than you came in with. And so this process of neuronal generation is really drives all aspects of behavior. So looking at some of the different parts of the brain, we have the, cere the cerebrum, the dicephalon right here. We have our midbrain, which has our pons, the mandula oblongata, the cerebellum, and the spinal cord. So over here, we have what the function or the structure is in the child and the adult. The cerebrum includes the cerebral cortex and white matter, as well as basal nuclei. The diencephalon includes the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. The midbrain is part of the brainstem. The pons are also part of the brainstem, as well as the cerebellum. The medulla oblongata is part of the brainstem as well. So looking at the different hemispheres of our brain, we have our left cerebral hemisphere and our right cerebral hemisphere. We have the cerebral cortex, the corpus callosum, and the basal nuclei. At a side shot, we have our diencephalon. This includes the thalamus, the pineal gland, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. And we'll speak a lot more about these when we get into our endocrine system. We have our brain stem, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So looking at the different areas of the brain and what they control. So we have our motor cortex, which controls the skeletal muscles. And this is contained within our frontal lobe. We also have the prefrontal cortex, which is helping us make decisions and planning. The Broca's area helps us to form speech. In the temporal lobe, we have the auditory cortex, which we use to interpret sound. We have the Wernick's area, which helps us to comprehend language, the cerebellum, and the occipital lobe, we have the visual cortex. This is where we process what we see, and we have pattern recognition. The visual association cortex, this helps us to combine images and to uh, an object recognition, knowing that a ball is a ball, a square is a square that that is a dog, that I am a person. So it's helping us to recognize objects. The parietal lobe has the somatosensory cortex, which gives us our sense of touch, and the sensory association cortex, which helps us to integrate the sensory information that we have. So language and speech. There are many studies of the brain where activity has been mapped out and is responsible for language and speech. We have the Broca's area in the frontal lobe, that is active when speech is generated. And we also have the Wernick's area in the temporal lobe, and it's active when speech is heard, so it's helping us to figure it out or interpret it. And these areas belong to a larger network of regions involved in language. So information processing. The cerebral cortex receives input from sensory organs and somatosensory receptors. The somatosensory receptors provide information about touch, pain, pressure, temperature, and our position of muscles and limbs in space, so our sense of balance. The thalamus then directs different types of output to distinct locations. So here we have our frontal and our parietal lobes and some of the things that they control. Kind of creepy looking, but we have our primary motor cortex, which involves the knee, the hip, the trunk, the shoulder, the elbow, the forearm, the wrist, the hand, the fingers, the thumb, the neck, brow, eye, face, lips, jaw, and the tongue. In our parietal lobe, it affects our genitalia, the leg, the hip, the trunk, the neck, the head, the upper arm, 
the elbow, the forearm, the hand, the fingers, the thumb, the eye, the nose, the face, the lips, the gums, the teeth, the jaw, the tongue, the pharynx, and the abdominal organs. Thank you very much. So the frontal lobe function. The frontal lobe damage may impair decision making and emotional responses, but it can still leave intellect and memory intact. The frontal lobes have a substantial effect on executive functions of thinking and making decisions. So back in the day when people had mental disorders, one of the more common treatments was to actually perform a lobotomy, where they basically stuck a wire up your nose and they scraped your frontal lobe. And they did this because they wanted to control people's emotions and they wanted to control their temper. Now they don't do this anymore because of all of the negative side effects, obviously. Well, I hope that was helpful, and I will talk to you guys soon.